Awesome. Um, and then I'm going to start letting people in. And then as people coming in, I will start the, the notes. So you will see people come in. Hold on. Start webinar. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Louisiana Opioid Action Summit series this year. We are so happy that you are joining us today. We're going to let the attendees kind of come in for the next few, for the next minute or so. So... Oh, wonderful. I am seeing people just coming in. I'm seeing some, some familiar names of those that attended our webinar in the past. So welcome back. Um, so for those of you that are new here, we start off, I started with a few housekeeping notes, um, information about accreditation, um, and then introduce our speaker. I will turn over the floor to our wonderful speaker today. Um, we do have the chat and the Q&A feature enabled at the bottom of your screen, feel free to use that throughout the presentation. We will do the bulk of the Q&A at the end of the presentation, um, but if Dr. Vicaria sees something that catches her eye throughout the presentation in the Q&A, she might stop and, and address it. So feel free not to wait to the end of the presentation to ask any questions that you think would be pertinent. Okay, so welcome. This webinar is Starting Where the Client Is, Guidelines for Harm Reduction Practice. Uh, it is presented by Dr. Sheila Vicario. This is a free educational event brought to you by Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Public Health, and Women's Foundation. This webinar is the first in the series for the Louisiana Opioid Action Summit. For more information on future presentations, please visit womensfoundation.com slash L-O-A-S. On there, you'll be able to register for all our future events. This session is accredited for 1.5 hours for the following social workers, general credit, LPCs, AMA category one credit, as well as ADRA. Full participation of this presentation is required to receive credit and we monitor throughout the session. In one week, you'll receive an email from Women's Foundation with instructions on how to claim your credits and access your certificate. If you dialed in by phone, please email info at womensfoundation.com. And in that email, please include your name and the phone number you dialed in with to receive credit. Okay, so a little bit about our speaker. Dr. Sheila Vicaria currently works at the Drug Policy Alliance as the Deputy Director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement. Dr. Vicaria received her master's in social work from Birmingham, Birmingham University and a post-master's certificate certificate in addictions from New York University. She worked for several years as a social worker in both traditional abstinence only outpatient settings and at a syringe exchange where she provided counseling use a harm reduction approach. She produced her PhD in social welfare at Florida International University School of Social Work. While serving as assistant professor at Long Island's University Social Work Department, she coordinated the substance use counseling concentration and taught courses infused with a harm reduction perspective. She completed her certificate of human rights and drug policy at Central European University in Budapest, which, she led, which led to her writing a report summarizing civil society input for the preparations leading up to the United Nations General Assembly special session on drugs in 2016. So welcome, Dr. Prakarya. Thank you so much for being our first presenter of 2023. Thank you so much for that welcome. And thank you for all of the staff uh, preparing the summit that invited and helped coordinate all of the things that led up to me being able to join you today. And I appreciate seeing such a great representation of attendees uh, here at, at the event today. And I hope that folks tuning into the recording also find it helpful. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm the Deputy Director of the Department of Research and Academic Engagement at Drug Policy Alliance, which is the national drug policy advocacy organization working to end the war on drugs. And in that position, I ensure that we are using the best available evidence to advocate for drug policies grounded in public health and human rights. So uh, harm reduction is uh, very, very dear to my heart. I've written and practiced in harm reduction for almost 15 years. 
And the presentation today, although it has social work in the, in the title, is only because it's actually based in a paper that I published in Clinical Social Work Journal about harm reduction. However, I believe that the lessons and the applications uh, resonate with a variety of professions, including those in healthcare, but also those involved in the criminal legal system, uh, in the child welfare system, and in other systems. I've just kept the title because um, I love sending people back to that paper. I'm really proud of that paper. And if you want a copy of that paper, please contact me and I'm happy to send it to you. So I'm going to be using a lot of images um, and photographs of people who are involved in harm reduction over the course of this presentation. And so I just want to thank the National Harm Reduction Coalition for allowing me to use the photographs that I use in this presentation today. So here we have Haven Wheelock from Outside In in Portland, Oregon. And when she defines harm reduction, she says, when you walk alone and in the shadows, it is easy to feel lost. Access to harm reduction brings humans into the light and community. It empowers health, hope, and humanity. Now, if you want a more clinical uh, definition, uh, I often lean on the definition from Alan Marlott, who many of us credit as being the godfather of harm reduction. Um, and so he says in, in his seminal book, harm reduction is a set of compassionate and pragmatic approaches for reducing the harms associated with high-risk behaviors and improving quality of life. So where did harm reduction come from? Where did the term come from? Who started it? Where, where can we pinpoint the origins of the movement? So many of us pinpoint the origins of the harm reduction movement as starting in the Netherlands in the 1980s. At the time, HIV was emerging, and as, as was hepatitis B, and people who injected drugs were some of the um, most impacted communities. And long before we had diagnoses or tests or available to test for them, people had noticed that they and other people they injected drugs with were starting to get sick. And they identified that perhaps the reason why they were all getting sick was because they were forced to start, share syringes with each other. Uh, Netherlands, like many parts of the, the world, um, criminalized syringes for non-medical uses. And so people who were able to acquire syringes to use them to inject drugs were often forced to share them because they really had no legal source for it. And so they said, if we and our loved ones are dying and getting sick with this kind of intractable illness, and we still don't really understand treatments, we still don't understand the course of, of this um, and what to do to stay healthy, maybe one thing we can do is bond together, come together, um, and start our own underground needle exchange programs where people can get sterile new syringes and swap out their old used syringes to make sure that no one accidentally or purposely uses those again. And they started what they called the Junkie Bond, which was the first drug user union that we can recognize internationally, in which people who use drugs actually came together in a form of mutual aid activism to help meet their own needs. And through underground channels, we're able to secure and acquire sterile syringes to then distribute amongst themselves. And so they started what we now identify as the first syringe exchange program in Amsterdam in 1984. Um, and by 1988, they'd already exchanged um, almost a quarter of a million syringes amongst themselves and dramatically reduced the spread of HIV in their communities. But now here we are decades later and harm reduction is still characterized by that core element of being driven by people who inject or use drugs themselves, meeting one another's needs um, and, and really helping to connect them to support. So syringe access continues to be a key part of what characterizes harm reduction programs, yet it also has expanded to include a variety of other measures and, and methods, including strategies um, such as um, distributing naloxone, the opioid overdose reversal medication, distributing safer smoking equipment, such as crack pipes and meth pipes. It also includes, say, obviously, safer sex uh, in information and tools, including condoms. Um, and it also includes overdose prevention centers, policies to reduce barriers to calling 911 in case of an overdose. And it also has in, in, like infused itself in various therapeutic approaches known as harm reduction therapy. Um, it also has become a part of our policy landscape in terms of expanding policies that allow easier access to sterile equipment, um, that allow uh, people to um, have less fear for calling 911 in case of an overdose, and all of those things as well. And here in New York City, where I live, 
um, an, an essential harm reduction intervention that's that's launched over the past two years is the two uh, overdose prevention centers located in New York City, uh, where people can bring pre-obtained drugs, use them on site, be uh, be connected to life-saving healthcare and medical supports, but also have someone there on site to respond in case of an overdose. So although we you know, credit the movement starting in 1984, we can see that harm reduction has expanded dramatically and is becoming much more well-recognized and understood as a public health approach and as a humanistic approach to working with people who use drugs. If you wanna learn a little bit more about the history of harm reduction as a movement, I highly recommend reading Maya Solovitz's uh, book called Undoing Drugs, in which she does a really excellent job of characterizing the history of, uh, of, of the harm reduction movement as we know it. Um, I do see that I've got a lot of action in the chat box um, and I'm just gonna see, okay, everyone's saying good morning. Good morning, everybody. Great. Um, <laughs> so I will keep going. Uh, so let's go into some harm reduction tenets and principles. First and foremost, harm reductionists will tell you that drugs are here to stay. Um, we and our ancestors have long since used mood-altering substances over the course of history, right? Uh, many of us come from cultures that had norms around moderate or occasional use of various substances, oftentimes derived from plants, right? And many times, uh, many of us have come from religious or spiritual practices in which substance use is, is often an ordained or an accepted part of, of that practice, right? So we can think of the way that people drink wine during communion, um, during Shabbos. Um, we can think about um, also the ways in which um, many spiritual practitioners um, in indigenous communities use uh, psychedelic plants for spiritual awakening, for spiritual development and evolution. Uh, but we can also think about very practically how um, various grains uh, and grapes were fermented into alcoholic beverages that many of our ancestors consumed and that we still consume today. Coffee and tea are some of the most widely used mild stimulant substances that have still carried over from our history and are often a big part of our lives today. Um, and harm reductionists will say that the use of various mood altering substances is such a normative part of our society. And although some forms of that use have been criminalized, we still often have regulated medical access to a lot of drugs that are pharmacologically very similar. And so this idea that heroin is bad, but oxycodone is, is medically acceptable or methamphetamine um, is should, should methamphetamine use should be eliminated, but you know we are prescribing ADHD medications and helping people actually um, succeed in school and work um, feels a bit contradictory. So this idea that drugs are going away or that certain drugs can be um, eliminated or that somehow we can live in a world free of certain types of drugs is a bit unrealistic, but also can detract from the point that if we focus instead on helping to keep people safe, we can actually help guide decisions and choices to reduce drug-related harms. Also, this idea is that comes from the place that long before criminal laws ever dictated what was a drug, what was a medication, and what was a legally available substance, um, you know, drug use was a moral issue, right? And it still continues to be one that for, for many people. But Focusing on drug use as a moral issue actually prohibits us from having open and frank conversations about drug use and humanizing the people who use them. Because once as you say that drug use is a moral issue, then there are certain people who are doing good things and certain people who are doing bad things. And when many of us are in the business of helping people be safer and be healthier, when you're fixated upon someone doing bad things or wrong things, it can get in the way of a healthy therapeutic relationship and actually truly being engaged in client-centered care, right? And the use of our criminal legal system to su supposedly manage, restrict, or punish our way out of drug use has actually ended up creating a lot more harm and has stratified communities and actually um, ended up uh, relying on a criminal legal system for oftentimes drug use that is a health issue that should be better dealt with with our health system. Another thing harm reductionists want people to understand is that drug use occurs on a continuum, right? And on one end of that continuum is abstinence, no use. And on the other end of that continuum can be heavy, uh, frequent, and oftentimes problematic and harmful levels of use. But that most people live somewhere in the middle of that continuum, and many of us 
find ourselves in different places along the continuum in different place, parts of our lives or in different aspects of our lives, right? And so, you know, we can think about abstinence. We can think about that there are some people who engage in levels of experimental use. Many of us may have identified, you know, activities of our past as being experimental. Some of us identify as social users. I myself identify as a social alcohol user myself. Um, and then we can think about the kinds of drugs that certain people use on a daily basis. Um, some of us use certain controlled medications on a daily basis that help improve our quality of life, help us to be able to take care of ourselves and our loved ones. Um, and some of us use those kinds of drugs to get by during the day, I myself caffeinate pretty heavily to get through my day, then we can think about those levels of use in which drug use is becoming harmful or associated with negative consequences, right? And so this idea when a harm reductionist say, let's talk about your drug use, it's not to say, do you or do you not use drugs? It's tell me about how frequently you use, how often you use, what it is that you use, because just the fact of you telling me that you use heroin or you use cocaine doesn't actually tell me about your relationship with that drug, how frequently you use it, whether you've experienced negative consequences. And so it really should be an invitation to open a broader conversation to really understand the people that you're talking with and where they're coming from, right? Because not all use is necessarily so-called abuse. Not all use is supposedly misuse, or not all use is a symptom of having a substance use disorder or an addiction, right? And so harm reductionists really want to have conversations to understand, you know, yes, I occasionally use cocaine, but the last time I used it was six months ago. It was very specific to a party I went to and something was happening. Or, you know, I do use heroin and I use several bags a day. And actually now that fentanyl is part of my drug supply, I use fentanyl even more often than I, than I used to use heroin, right? Meanwhile, I did try mushrooms at a festival once, didn't really like it, wasn't for me, never used again, right? And by being able to have those kinds of conversations, you can actually have more nuance in understanding what this individual person's experience is. And when you have these conversations about the different drugs that people use, you can see that use patterns can vary. You know, there is this common myth that people who can't control one drug can't control any drug, when actually people often have very clear preferences um, for the drugs that they use. And it's really important for us to do a comprehensive assessment or evaluation in understanding what those different patterns are and what those different levels of frequency are and which drugs are associated with harms or that are troubling that person. I think the other really important thing when we have conversations and acknowledge that drug use occurs on a continuum is that we can truly recognize then that harm is relative, right? So I understand that my once a day coffee habit, um, as long as I'm drinking it from homebrew, um, isn't that isn't that much of a problem. But if I find myself going to Starbucks nowadays with the way prices are looking, a $7 a day Starbucks habit may be a, a little bit more of a hit to my budget than I would otherwise like, right? So understanding, you know, like, is the consequence associated with this drug use something that is um, harmful or affecting your life in a negative kind of way and what those ways are? You know, for instance, for a lot of unstably housed or street-based homeless people, um, methamphetamine use has been a growing uh, strategy for some people to actually adapt to and to survive with life on the streets. We hear time and time again from many people who never historically used methamphetamine that it is now a drug in their repertoire. And one of the reasons that many street-based homeless people talk about using methamphetamine is because it's a great tool to stay up all night so that you can continue to walk the streets and no one can assault you or rob you, right? And so it's interesting to talk about why is it that you're using this drug? And even though it keeps you all night and it kind of makes you a little paranoid, I understand now how you're willing to deal with those consequences because it's safer to sleep on the street in the daytime because at least if someone came up to you or something happened, there'd be people walking by to respond or call 911. But if someone were raping me or um, assaulting me or robbing me in the middle of the night while I was asleep, there would be no one there to help me, right? So understanding, you know, in these conversations that harm also is relative. So for me, the idea of being up on a stimulant all night and kind of losing my mind a little bit after doing it for a couple nights in a row feels like a, a crisis and it feels like something that, you know, maybe should be a problem for you. But if you explain to me that actually the harm of, yes, like some of that paranoia 
yes, the appetite suppression um, actually is adaptive because you're using it to cope with a structural or social problem. It gives me a space to actually have a little bit more compassion and to see you as an actor who is often making choices uh, within the context of the options that are available to you. Right. I also think that being able to talk about drug use occurring on a continuum is also an invitation for people to talk about are there your are there any patterns of use that you're engaging in that do feel dangerous or harmful to you? And you know, we do know that after several nights of not sleeping and being on a bender on a stimulant, that it can lead to really troubling psychotic features. It can lead to people becoming incredibly emaciated um, and dehydrated. Um, and so being able to first at least have the conversation about how frequently, how much, you know, which drug, you know, how often, and then being able to say, are there any aspects of it that you understand might carry some risks from it? You can then invite a broader conversation to actually think about solutions and strategies in an unstigmatizing and kind of safe way, creating a container for that conversation. The other thing that I often remind people is, is that harm reductionists have harm as being the first part of our name or our titles or our, you know, identification in this movement. Um, and we do recognize that there are potential harms for use. And what I like about harm reduction is that it enables, it enables us, as soon as we get over the moralizing of talking about drug use, that it actually enables us to have really productive conversations in getting some insights from the people that we're working with about what the harms are that they're facing and then the strategies that we can implement to help reduce them. So um, I'm gonna, I have this graphic here that's a little bit difficult to, to see, so I'm gonna zoom in. But what you can see here is that this is actually a really seminal graphic that I use um, from David Nutt and colleagues. And um, I found it a really helpful um, illustration of really kind of quantifying what we mean by drug-related harms. So here in this paper, what they did was they, they wanted to look at drug-related harms experienced by people in their communities, first in two different ways. So there's two prongs here. The first prong is identifying the harms that are faced by users themselves, and then those harms that are faced by communities. Because again, the more we can pinpoint where the harms are, the more strategic we can be about implementing solutions and helping people to stay safe, right? So I'm gonna zoom in for a second over here. So you can see here in this top set of three prongs, you know, let's identify what are the harms that users might face of drug X, cocaine, cannabis, heroin, alcohol, right? And so, this paper does a really good job of talking about how we first must acknowledge that there are going to be certain physical health risks and health harms that we should be able to talk about and be literate in being able to explain, right? Because there's drug-specific mortality or drug-specific damage or drug-related mortality or related damage that we should be able to talk about, right? So for instance, this is when someone, it is a known fact that when someone, con, you know, consumes a high amount of opioid beyond their personal level of tolerance, that high levels of opioid intoxication can be associated with respiratory suppression, right? People stop breathing, right? So being able to talk about um, overdoses as being um, a potential risk factor and being able to pinpoint, yes, like because I use um, several bags of fentanyl a day, this is something that we should be talking about. You know, when was the last time you overdosed? Who were you with? What happened? Who took care of you? What are your plans to prevent or address overdose in the future? Can we talk about it? Do you have naloxone on hand? Do you use alone? Um, do you often mix multiple classes of drugs? Because we know that adding sedatives on top of um, opioids can increase, uh, can have a synergistic effect and can increase uh, overdose risk for certain communities and certain people, depending on their tolerance, right? And so being able to have those kinds of frank conversations that we know that like all drug use carries risk, all drugs can be dangerous, there are tools and strategies and education that we can provide to help people make more informed decisions or to be better equipped to deal with those consequences or to avoid those consequences, right? And I think another really important thing that harm reductionists are willing to have open and frank conversations with are, are there psychological effects associated with your drug use, right? You know, do you get behind the wheel after you drive, right? Um, do you have physiological dependence? So you don't want to be shooting several bags of fentanyl a day, but at this point, your tolerance is so high and there is no methadone clinic 
close by or accessible to you, and you don't have a buprenorphine waiver prescriber who's taking new clients, is that what's actually playing out right now? So you're forced to kind of deal with the fentanyl because the medications that are the gold standard treatments are unfor un unfortunately inaccessible to you, right? And then also being having conversations about like what has happened to your social network since you've started using drugs? Have you damaged and lost certain relationships? Are there, you know, have you lost your home over this? Have you lost your car over this? Have you lost your job over this? Being able to actually have real conversations because then we can actually pinpoint those harms. And on a more meso or macro level, right, we can think about the overall harms associated with drugs in our communities as those that um, affect others, right? And so all of those harms, including, you know, the kinds of harmful things that I said or did under the influence that hurt my loved ones, um, but also the ways in which um, I might have had to engage in various behaviors to uh, support my habit, um, but also kind of the lost productivity of not working, the way in which my drug use has affected my ability to maintain community. Um, we know that Americans' appetite for drugs is affecting America's relationship with our foreign allies and with our neighbors. We know that American drug use and drug demand is destroying our relationship with Mexico. There's a very there's a lot of animosity between our countries right now because of some of the challenges of the fact that we have an insatiable drug demand in this country and a lot of drugs are pouring in through Mexico, right? And so like all of those kinds of conversations that are like a macro conversation about what drug use in this country actually is having um, in, in terms of an impact. And are there policy solutions and international diplomatic strategies that we can use to help actually facilitate better, more congenial, respected, respectable relationships between countries as well, right? So, you know, harm reductionists are very clear that we want to be able to talk about all of these things, that we cannot look at drug use in a bubble. We cannot look at drug harm and just make it its own umbrella category. It's actually something that's very specific and particular on an individual level, but that also the global and national and local uh, impacts of drug use are also strategies that we can develop, harm, harm reduction strategies can be developed for policy interventions for those kinds of aspects as well. I think the other really important thing is that, and this is where I think what also makes harm reduction stand out, is this idea here that even non-dependent users, people without substance use disorders, can face drug-related harms, right? So I may not have a drinking problem, but I went out and I said some really horrible things to someone under the influence, right? Or, you know, I may not use cocaine that frequently, but the last time I did, I had a really bad bloody nose for several days, right? And had a lot of damage. So understanding that even in our current system as it's built, the only option that people have who use drugs to get help is when their use gets enough to be a problem, a substance use disorder, and then they're eligible for intake at an outpatient treatment facility or a detox or a rehab or a residential program. But currently, our entire system of care has nothing to offer occasional or recreational users. If anything, our system just says, wait until it gets worse, and when it's bad enough and you meet criteria and your insurance will pay for it, go get treatment. Harm reduction says that people, regardless of their levels of use, whether or not they have a substance use disorder, actually everyone's kind of at risk for some drug-related harms when they consume them. And it would be great for us to arm them with education, tools, strategies to stay safe, right? Because it's that bulk of people, the occasional user, the recreational user, who often aren't armed with tools or strategies to stay safe. And if armed with tools, could potentially be prevented from having their problems escalate to the level of a substance use disorder. Um, I am seeing, uh, okay, yes, we will have copies of the slideshow. Um, okay, great. Um, let's get back to the slide deck. So the other thing that harm reductionists argue is that people use drugs for reasons. What do I mean by that? Well, that drug use is a meaningful activity that has significance to those of us who use them, right? It's not just a throwaway behavior. It's not just something that you can just arbitrarily tell someone to stop and expect them to stop. Because we have to acknowledge that drugs 
serve one or many functions for all of us. And again, I, I, I'm going to continue to lean in on these alcohol examples because I find that they make uh, drug use conversations a little bit more accessible for people who may not be exposed to other drugs. But I hope that you'll be able to generalize from some of these examples as well. So for instance, right, um, I think of alcohol in traditional American culture. When do we consume alcohol? We consume alcohol after a really rough day at work to take the edge off. We drink alcohol to celebrate momentous occasions. I got that raise, I got that promotion, I got that new job, congrats on the new baby, you just got married. Um, but we use it to, to commiserate as well. Alcohol is often a part of many of our grieving rituals when it comes to, you know, wakes are notorious for being alcohol involved. Uh, we think about alcohol as being the marker or the signifier of the end of the workday or the end of the work week. Happy hour culture is very strong in many of our communities. And part of that is because you made it through the grind for another, you know, for the weekend, right? Um, and, you know, alcohol is consumed um, as part of sporting events, as part, uh, as part of celebrations, as part of, um, you know, all of these different things, right? And so when we think of alcohol and like telling people to stop drinking or assuming that people can just give up alcohol, we have to acknowledge that actually it wasn't just drink, it wasn't just drinking. It was socializing, it was connecting, it was grieving, it was mourning, it was um, uh, helping the time pass, it was recreation, it was loosening up, it was kind of having an opportunity to disconnect and unplug a little bit from your day to day, right? Um, and it kind of still um, gives you that extra, um, context to understand. And yes, I, I just saw that one comment. Um, uh, I, I do appreciate that you feel less pressure because you'll have the, the, the slide, but I hope that you continue to take notes if there are any little thoughts that you have during this that you find are helpful. Um, I also think that people miss, like, uh, do not really acknowledge the fact that ritual also plays a huge part in, in, in people's drug use. So going back to the alcohol uh, kind of uh, example, there are many people who are very much like their own little mixologists, people who like to make a mixed drink or that they like to make a cocktail, right? And you think about if you've ever seen someone who loves making cocktails, or maybe this is you, um, choosing out the right glass, making sure that it's chilled, getting the shaker ready, putting all the contents in, the sound of the shaking of the ice in, 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 the, in, the, in the bottle, making sure to kind of line the rim, pouring it out, putting the garnish, right? When you think about the ways that ritual actually play a big role in alcohol use, it should also help you to see that ritual also plays a role when it comes to other drug use. People who inject drugs frequently talk about all of the kind of feelings that they associate with getting ready to, to feel that next shot, right? All the preparation of getting the needle ready, doing the, you know, feeling this, like hearing the sizzle, hearing the lighter go, uh, doing the draw up, and then like kind of the first kind of prick of the, of the injection, the flashback into the, into the syringe, kind of the, the, the feeling of all of those kinds of things are often very uncomfortable for people who don't inject drugs to even think about. Um, but if we can look at cocktail preparation and understand the romance of it, we have to have some degree of compassion that there is that same feeling for many people that's associated with their drug use of their, their use of other drugs. And again, that is why it's not so easy to just say stop injecting, right? Or just stop using because there are so many other facets along with that, right? And the ritual of consumption, right? Pre preparing, consuming, and being intoxicated with others often creates all these social reinforcing cues because drugs can often bring, you know, wh whether you like it or not, whether it makes you feel comfortable or not, drugs help people connect with one another. Um, and uh, we can't minimize that, that role that, that that has for people, right? And for a lot of people with trauma, drugs can serve a dualistic function, whether it's helping to suppress and dissociate so that they can go to work, do their job, raise their kids, do the things that they need to do, but it can also sometimes help to access those dissociated parts of myself. I'm an angry drunk, 
but it's because I'm such a subdued, sober person because of my trauma, that that rage is so suppressed in my day-to-day -day life. But when I have alcohol, it's almost like that angry part of me, that angry, hurt little girl can come out, right? And so understanding those kinds of things can be really, really important, right? Um, and many of us can credit different substances for helping us to survive, right? Um, many people have told me heroin saved my life. And I have to believe them because I can understand how a numbing euphoric opioid when taken in really challenging, emotionally stressful or just structurally stressful situations could be the thing that got me through unlivable circumstances, right? And understanding all of those facets can be really, really challenging for a lot of us who don't have these experiences or who do have kind of uh, knee-jerk responses to this, but it's really important if you're going to work with people who use drugs to understand that drug use is a multifaceted, multifunctional activity. Um, and I kind of touched on this already, but also recognizing that people who use drugs or when you use a substance that you're often doing a cost-benefit analysis. You know, I know that if I use this now, I'm going to get that boost of energy. I'm going to get that motivation to walk out the door. I'm going to be able to do this, this, and this. But I also know that, you know, I took, I drank this coffee at 4 p.m. And I've got an early day tomorrow. And dear God, I hope I can fall asleep at a decent hour so I can wake up and do what I got to do tomorrow. But right now, I've got all these spreadsheets to fill out. I've got all of this stuff to do. And you know what? I need to push through for these last couple hours of the workday, right? And if you think about it that way, people are doing those cost-benefit analyses all the time, looking at the proximal benefit and kind of sometimes discounting or, or saying, I will be able to deal with the distal, right? And instead of treating someone who does that as irrational or having bad, bad values or being impulsive or being immature, instead just saying, given the tools and strategies that they have, and the fact that they know that consequences will come. They've decided in this moment, though, that those consequences are something that they're willing to deal with because the payoff in this moment is so important and valuable. And I find that oftentimes we're all a little bit guilty of making drug use seem impulsive, irrational, emotional to minimize people's motivations for drug use. But what I would argue for all of us is that it's helpful for us to actually sit back for a second and to kind of think of this a little bit more globally from that person's perspective. And it's not to say that sometimes it isn't impulsive, right? But to give people more grace in telling you what their reasons are and what the the way you know the how they are weighing these pros and cons for themselves. And if you take nothing else away from today, I want you to take away this next sentence that I wrote. Harm reduction is truly at the at our core. Understand that you cannot take away you know do not take away what you cannot replace. Too often, we expect people to give up drugs and somehow be able to show up to all their appointments, be compliant, call ahead and schedule that next appointment, show up to work on time, do all of those kinds of things. Because we just assume that the alcohol was the problem. And as soon as we tell them that they have to stop using it to be able to do all these other things, that somehow it's just going to all work out. And one of the things that we don't do is we don't have enough of these comprehensive conversations going through what are the reasons, what are the moments, when are your troubling times, who are the people that you associate drug use with, what are the situations that really trigger you? Because before I expect you to just throw away your coping strategy, which is your drug, I should understand what I'm, what I'm taking away from you and offer you equal, if not more effective tools and strategies to be able to then do this on your own. Right, Because one of the biggest things that we often do to our clients and the people we serve is we set them up for failure by taking away their, their coping strategy and then making them feel like failures when things get hard and they return back to their strategies. Um, and it's a setup for them, but it's also a setup for us because no one likes feeling disappointed or let down. And so I think it's really important before having conversations and broaching conversations about, do you want to cut down? Do you want to give it up? What are some strategies that work for you for dealing with stress? Because I hear you saying that you, you use cocaine when you're really stressed out. So tell me, what are the strategies that you know that work for you? And how can we start folding them in to um, your day-to-day -day life so that you might notice the next time you feel that way, you'll use that strategy instead of cocaine. And can you tell me how that goes? 
and let's talk about it. Um, so the other thing that I really think is important about how harm reductionists talk about drugs is that we talk about people having relationships with their drugs. And what I like about talking about in the day-to-day -day of the clinical work with a client, the relationship element rather than the addiction element, although, you know, for your charts and paperwork, write what you got to write, right? Client has cocaine use disorder, what have you, right? But I think within the context of a helping relationship or a therapeutic relationship to even talk about how this person has a relationship with cocaine and maybe it's a love hate relationship. Maybe it's mostly a love relationship, um, but being able to say, you know, this is a bi-directional thing, right? Like I am not saying that you are sick and somehow addicted to this substance, right? It's non-pathologizing. And a lot of how we talk about drug use makes it seem like our clients are sick or, um, like that they're sick or that they're criminals or that they're incapable of, of making good choices, but instead, um, you know, offering a, a framing so that you have a relationship with your drug and this relationship can be helpful to harmful. And let's talk about the ways in which it can sometimes be helpful and sometimes be harmful. Because again, to a person's day-to-day -day life, Saying that they have a substance use disorder may be like helpful in making sure that they're eligible for services, right? You know, like it, it's, you know, so much of how we provide care is gate kept on diagnoses, but it does make in someone's day-to-day -day life, someone think like, am I sick because of the way I use cocaine? Um, am I sick because of my relationship with heroin? Um, maybe it's, more so that I used it in ways that gave me what I wanted, but eventually stopped giving me what, what I wanted. But I was so stuck in these habits that I need to think of a different way to forge through my relationship with heroin. I also think that addiction is this thing, it's a dichotomous concept, meaning that either yes, you're addicted or no, you're not. And again, as I said before, harm reduction has applications to people whether or not they meet diagnostic criteria. So it's actually even more freeing because then you can talk about even how an occasional user of alcohol has a relationship with alcohol. Um, and you can talk about what are the ways in which alcohols let you down? What are the ways in which alcohols helped you? And how do we make sure that you get the most benefits without the most harms, right? Because relationships can change. So much of how we talk about addiction, substance use disorder, is that it's this chronic relapsing brain disease and you're stuck with it for life. And for a lot of clients, that's an impossible way to think about the rest of their life. And instead, if you can, within the context of your own clinical work, to engage them in thinking about, well, you have a relationship with cocaine and she gives you this, but she also takes this for you, from you. Um, how do we, how do we work that out? How do we reconcile that? And do you feel like you can change your relationship with her? What are some tools and strategies that I can help you with to reduce your reliance upon her or make it so that you only lean on her in the best possible moments with the right people around and in safe circumstances, right? And again, going back to what I said earlier, when you talk about drug use in terms of relationships, you can then see how people can have different relationships with the different drugs that they use, right? So cocaine, she and I got some ups and downs. Alcohol, I don't even really drink that much. We don't even hang out that much, right? And I haven't seen psilocybin mushrooms since I was 21, right? So being able to have those kinds of conversations and to, to be able to really like sit with the client and understanding that these relationships can be different. And this is a real kind of contrast to how most of us were trained to talk about drugs in this country um, and how most dominant models look at drug use in that if you have a problem with one, we often presume that you have a problem with all of them uh, or that you're potentially addicted to all drugs. And that oftentimes this can cut off conversations before they even start. Because if I assume that yes, you, you're coming in because you have a problem with your drinking and you're telling me that you don't remember the last time you used cocaine, it's still really important for me to tell you never use cocaine because you never know where that's gonna lead you. Um, may not be helpful for all people at all levels of care. And it may especially not be helpful with someone that you're starting out with who's like, well, I'm here to talk about the alcohol. Can we focus on that first? I don't remember the last time I used cocaine, but yes, sure. You know, like we can talk about it eventually. Um, and I think that this also really hones in on the fact that harm reduction allows us to have really individualized conversations with people rather than assuming that someone says, well, you know, I'm sitting next to her in group and like my experience was different. A lot of times, and I was guilty of this too, when I worked at rehab, 
we were supposed to tell our clients, sounds like you're suffering from terminal uniqueness. Actually, you're all here for the same reason. Yes, sure, maybe you think that your drug use was that different from hers or his or whoever's, but actually you're all here together. So look where your way got you. I was part of the system. I was I was made to say those kinds of things. My, my coworkers said those kinds of things. People I worked with across various settings said those kinds of things. Harm reductionists don't find that helpful. We actually are willing to have conversations with people. What are the different drugs? What are the different ways that they're playing out in your life? Let's talk about those different relationships. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, I'm glad that people are finding, yes, the PowerPoint will be provided. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about a really helpful model that harm reductionists use when we talk and explain, like talk about drugs and explain drugs. And why is it that some people can't drink alcohol moderately or feel like they can't drink alcohol moderately while some people can drink it on the, on the weekends and be totally fine? Why some people can occasionally use cocaine and why some people really struggle to manage their cocaine use. Um, why, are, why are some people chippers, people who occasionally use heroin, and why some people develop problems. So what I like about the drug set setting model is that to me, it offers an alternative to disease models of addiction. Um, there might be some of you on the call who are big proponents of the disease model of addiction. It's a brain disease. Um, it's a medical disease. It requires medical treatment. Some of you may or may not ascribe to some of the more moralistic models. You know, if people had better values, they probably wouldn't use those kinds of drugs and then they probably wouldn't have developed those problems. Um, and so I find myself all the time kind of having conversations with people who see it as a moral issue, who, people who kind of see it as a disease and other people who are like, I don't really know if it's a, a moral issue or a disease model, but I will tell you it's a crime. And people who do this are criminals and they need to be adjudicated and they need to be rehabilitated uh, through the criminal legal system, right? So I like to lean on, you know, so when people ask me, you know, do you think addiction is a disease? I say, I'd rather think about addiction and people's other kinds of relationships with drugs as being dictated by three different forces. Uh, the first force being the drug itself. So here is the top part, the drug in, in this illustration. And this model comes from uh, Norman Zinberg and his research in the 70s that he published in his book called Drug Set Setting uh, that I highly recommend to anyone who's interested read. Um, and what he said was that drug use and people's relationships with drugs are dictated by three different factors and variables. First and foremost, the drug itself, right? So there is enough research to know what some of the pharmacological effects of certain drugs are, right? So we know that cocaine is a central nervous system stimulant. We know that benzodiazepines are central nervous system depressants. We know that uh, cannabis and cannabis products uh, engage with the cannabinoid system and thereby have some really interesting and complex effects. Um, there's no single kind of uh, profile for, for the effects, but we know certain things about them, right? Um, and how often you consume a drug, how much of a drug you consume, um, and you know whether it's adulterated or regulated can all affect your experience when you use that drug, right? But in addition to just the drug itself, right? Drug use just doesn't drive addiction or problematic use. There's other variables because the person matters, right? So in this model drug set setting, the set is the person, the person who's using the substance. I am the, the, the set that the theater is playing out on, for instance, right? Or where the effects are playing out on. So for me as the set, what are my expectations going into this drug use experience? Have I seen it before? Have I seen other people use this drug before? Have I used this drug before? Um, do I have a tolerance for this drug? Am I expecting a positive experience? Am I a little nervous about taking it? Um, have I slept? Um, why am I using it right now? What's making me, what, what's, what's my motivation, right? Because the drug's known pharmacological effects can still be dictated by what's happening with me and what's going on with me, my unique biology, my unique, my unique psychology is going to affect how, how I feel about this experience. And then the last but most important piece, I think, is the setting. Where am I consuming this? Who am I consuming this with? Am I with people I feel safe with? Am I with people that I don't know? Am I alone? Am I in the company of others, right? Are they using more than me? Are they using less than me? Is that gonna affect how much I use? 
Um, also, is this an illegal drug? Am I afraid of getting arrested for using this drug? Because all three of these factors can dictate how my first drug using experience goes, whether I want to use it again, whether I've used it so much because it's actually deeply entrenched in all of those factors, right? So for instance, going to a festival where everyone else is using psychedelics and me having my first experience, but me not being with my friends could mean that a drug that I heard was gonna be really fun to take at this festival. I actually have a really bad trip and I get really paranoid and really anxious, right? And that first experience impacted by the known pharmaceutical effects of the psychedelic, my current anxiety and being a little bit out of my element and me being surrounded by people I don't know is gonna make it a negative experience, for instance. And maybe that's why I never wanna use it again. Or the next time I decide to use it, I make sure I'm with the right people who can keep an eye on me but also that like I'm feeling comfortable and safe, right? Whereas say the first time I ever use heroin is with a boyfriend who I've never tried heroin before. He uses heroin. I've had my own challenges in life. I've had my own trauma in life. And I know that my husband, my, my partner uses it, right? And I see how it makes him feel. And I have some curiosity. What is that going to be like for me? And he says, well, it's going to chill you out. It'll calm you down. You're not going to be feeling so stressed out. I'd love for this to be something we did together, right? So he's influencing my expectancies. I know that this drug is going to have certain effects and taking it together becomes a thing that we do together as a sign of intimacy. And you can see how something like that could then facilitate perhaps me leaning on it a bit more because then it becomes a thing that we do together, right? And so instead of saying, you know, this is a diseased person, it's something about their brain, they just can't moderate their use, or saying, well, well, you know, Susie and Tom had four kids and, and, you know, Susie had a drinking problem, but none of her kids have drinking problems. So that means that addiction isn't genetic rather than seeing that there are so many other complex variables that can affect the manifestation of perhaps an underlying risk. If they're never put in the situation where they're exposed, whether they're, you know, where, where their mindset was and what environment in, in, in which they were consuming. And I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, but I find the drug set setting model to be a very useful one in talking with clients, being like, this is kind of, this might help to explain a little bit about why it is that you can do one thing, but you may struggle with another. But also, are there certain things about your environment that we can actually change so that your drug using experiences are safer and less risky? Having someone around with naloxone, being prepared to call 911, making sure that no one else is getting as intoxicated as you so they can respond, right? All of those kinds of things can also lead to better conversations. Another really key thing that harm reductionists talk about is that people who continue to use drugs matter. So many of the new task forces that are coming up, so many of the new recovery programs that are coming up all say, let's bring in people with lived experience. Let's bring in people who know what it's like. But even in those cases, we're talking about people with lived experience past experience, people in recovery, people who've already been abstinent for however many months, years, or whatever, as being those peer navigators. But rarely in these conversations do we think about, well, if we talk to people who are actively using drugs, what could they tell us? How could they inform our services? And what could we be learning from them? So here we have someone on the left who says, people who use drugs are valuable and very important. Always show them dignity and respect. And on the right, we have someone who says, we can prevent overdose by humanizing drug users, right? So an important thing in harm reduction is that our roots, as I told you, started with people who were actively injecting drugs, active injection drug users, who said, hey, we're getting sick. We see the problem, but we can come up with the solutions and we can help one another to stay safe in this current moment while systems are neglecting us. And so the, another key characteristic of harm reduction programs is that it, and, and harm reduction as a movement, is that many of us are current drug users, including injection drug users, including stimulant users, including all drugs on the face of the planet. And many of us still see the value of this movement and are able to, because we're so committed to it, to engage in all of these efforts to expand access to care and services, right? And it flips on this on the head this idea that that we got to wait for people to come to us to get help right and instead of saying let's wait until they're willing to jump through all the hoops of our program which I'll also get get into on on the next slide it's saying like they're already out in the community 
how do we help meet their needs while they're still out there until they're ready for whatever else they might want to access, right? Um, and that even people who are currently using drugs are motivated for something. And we build our systems on the assumption that they're motivated for abstinence, and we're not willing to help them until they're motivated for that very specific thing, when actually a lot of them are very motivated for a variety of things, right? First and foremost, obviously, there's, there's a lot of value to having sterile new, brand new equipment for use, right? And so giving them something that brings them in the door, but then allowing them access to other services and supports that are no longer contingent upon them actively committing to recovery or being in an abstinence-based recovery. And that for so many people, their involvement in a harm reduction program is the first time that they were invited to be part of a community um, that wasn't contingent upon meeting someone's expectations for something. And, you know, when I worked at the needle exchange programs, our most popular needle exchange hours were when people who injected drugs were giving out needles to each other, right? When they were able to, like, not feel as embarrassed to pull up their arm and show the abscess, not feel so embarrassed when asking for more syringes than they did last week, right? And, and that actually created a really great recruitment tool because people were bringing their friends in. And that's what you want. You want the word of mouth to spread, spread through the word of mouth. Yes. Um, and also, like, you know, a lot of our support groups at the Needle Exchange were co-facilitated by me and a peer. And so, like, oftentimes, you know, we'd have a discussion on a topic and I might lean on that peer to, like, kick off the discussion. Right. And like having them there to kind of model group participation and self-disclosure actually was really helpful in kicking off um, support groups all the time. And, you know, we gave them opportunities to get involved in advocacy events, to go, um, you know, to do various other things. And it was super, super helpful, right? And, you know, I hate this word addict, but I want to put it in here because I think that many people have this idea that people who are actively using drugs, especially the most marginalized people, right? So street homeless, low income, um, heavy duty users are just addicts who can't really you can't expect much from them. They're unreliable, they're unmotivated, they're uninterested, you know, they're hedonists. But actually, you know, from the harm reduction movement, when given a community that accepts them lovingly and 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 uh, without judgment, um, people become parts of communities. They feel like community members. They're actually then seen more as friends and family members and people who have something to contribute to their community. And so this brings me to my next slide because I know that that was this was like a preference potentially was talking about language. And so language matters when we talk about drug use um, and when we talk about people who use drugs and it conveys. It conveys our values. It conveys how we perceive people. It tells people what we think of them um, and even using language that we think of as throwaway language in day-to-day -day speech, whether it's with your friends or when you're out, your word choice is being listened to by the people in your life. And so if I'm struggling with drug use, but I heard you call someone an addict or a junkie, I've already put you in that box of people that I can't talk to about my drug use now, because you never know who's listening, right? And so um, you know, some of the easiest words that we often kind of talk about needing to remove and phase out of our vocabulary are words like addict, alcoholic, or a drunk, junkie, crackhead. See, so first of all, these words are incredibly dehumanizing. They make your identity dependent on your relationship with a drug. So you are no longer a crafter, a mother, a daughter, a neighbor, you know, uh, a social worker you are defined by your relationship with heroin. And when you reduce someone to any single identity, uh, you then are unable to see yourself as anything else either. When I'm so busy being called a junkie, I can't see myself as anything other than a junkie. I can't see that I'm actually a talented artist. I can't see that I used to be a successful lawyer and that I still have a JD and I could still practice one day. Um, and that I have this entire legal skill set that a small minority of people have, yet it's currently the crisis that I'm in that I'm being defined by, right? Um, but it also, again, conveys judgment towards certain drugs that are on many levels not pharmacologically different from legal drugs. So again, you know, it's, it's really easy to call someone 
a junkie, but we wouldn't call someone receiving a similar dose of a controlled opioid in a hospital emergency room the same thing because they broke their arm, right? So again, it's also being really specific about the drug, not even the fact that it has the same effects as regulated drugs, right? Now, some of the other words that I have here are maybe a little bit people haven't thought about as much. So denial. We often say, oh, she's in denial. He's in denial. Uh, watch out for that one. Um, but what that tells us is that I've decided your problem. I've decided your diagnosis. I've decided what you need. And... Um, you have a different definition of your problems. You have a different definition of your strengths. You have a different definition of your goals. You see things a little bit differently than me, or I'm not safe enough for you to admit that you see a, you have a problem and you want to change because I've clearly proven, proven myself as uncaring or unsympathetic, right? And so be careful when you use the word denial. I, because oftentimes people living through the negative consequences know that they're living through it. I know that abscess is huge. I know I didn't show up to that appointment. I know. But when you come at me, how you come at me is going to dictate my response. And if you come at me showing disdain, uh, judgment, and whatever, and you just want to play power play because you want me to say, I've got a problem with heroin or I've got a coke problem and to kind of grovel a little bit, I might have enough self-respect that I'm not going to do it. So I would say let's avoid um, um, oh Tammy, I'm seeing your comments. That's rough. Um, yeah, so this idea of uh, framing someone as being in denial when perhaps they're reluctant to tell you what they really think are their problems. Maybe they're reluctant to tell you how they're really seeing things. And so I would argue, dig deep when you want to say someone's in denial and think about your role in perhaps soliciting the kind of response that you did from that person and how maybe your engagement could change their engagement. But that also, if you remember the stages of change, the trans theoretical model, there are a lot of people who are pre-contemplative or contemplative. And so instead of saying they're in denial, maybe they truly are pre-contemplative. And so it's about using those motivational interviewing school skills to kind of get at what it is that is concerning them, what is troubling them and what they wanna work on. Um, <laughs> I'd also say the same thing with resistance. Resistant to what? Resistant to whom? How did I come at them? Is it that I'm actually offering them an, un an objectively unappealing treatment plan or like, a, a you know, assist a, like I'm trying to set up a plan or a strategy that really isn't appealing to them? Can I just say that they don't like it? They don't like it. They don't want to have to show up to the clinic every day. Like they are ready to do that. But maybe there is something that they are ready to do and I need to find out what it is. This idea of denial and resistance is very much grounded in the provider, defining the problem, defining the plan, defining the solutions, and expecting the client to just be like, yes, that's right, you know everything, like, well, I'm going to go along with it. And almost this idea that any client that doesn't immediately embrace your plan somehow doesn't care about their recovery, doesn't want to get better, uh, doesn't want help, right? Um, some other things to kind of consider as well are the words like relapse. So... Um, you know, many people use the term relapse when they're talking about abstinence-based recovery, when someone returns to use. But relapse can come with a really heavy connotation for people who are still trying to get their bearings in potentially a re, you know, uh, an abstinence-based recovery. And so for some people, there's a lot of finality with the word relapse because it means that I've fallen off the wagon, you know, I got to get back on track. It means that I Got to get a new day one chip if I'm going to AA meetings or NA meetings. Um, it means that I got to clean the slate and start over again. And for a lot of people, especially people who've had a lot of instability in their lives, you know, that can be incredibly triggering and really harmful. And it can be, it can really set them back even further. And one of the things that I often point to, and I'll maybe talk about this later, is the abstinence violation effect. Um, and Alan Marlett wrote about this as well. And um because I'm talking to folks in the South and not people in the city, I will say the abstinence violation effect is like getting the F it. <laughs> the F it because I've already screwed up. F it because I've cleared off my, my, uh, my clean time, my clean time, right? F it because clearly I couldn't keep it together. 
right? And so now I've gone for, you know, I, I, I went out and I had one drink and in the back of my mind, I was like, you know what, my provider's going to know tomorrow. I'm going to tell her when I see her that I had a drink and she's going to call it a relapse. And I might as well just drink the whole six pack now. It's the effort. I've already done it, right? It's like when you're on a diet and you've had a bite of cake and you say, well, if I've already broken the diet, might as well eat the whole slice, right? Or eat the whole cake. And so we have to be really careful of like the kinds of language we use. So if someone has returned to use, you can call it returning to use. You can call it a slip. You can call it a lapse. There's just something really heavy duty about the word relapse that I would just caution people to be mindful of, that's all. Also this idea of clean versus dirty. I'm clean, I'm 99 days clean, I'm 30 days clean, I'm whatever days clean versus I'm dirty, right? And oftentimes we use this terminology when talking about urinalysis drug screen results. I pissed clean, parole officer. I, you know, yes, it's gonna come up dirty. I'm just telling you now, I already went in, I filled it out, but before you even put the dipstick in, yes, it's gonna be dirty, I used this weekend. What does this tell us? It says that drugs are contagion and that you are dirty and all of the things that come along with it, dirty, disposable, trash, uh, no value, um, clean, has the, its own morality attached to it, its own values attached to it, purity. It, and again, it affirms this idea that drugs somehow can, are contagion and contaminate you. So again, is your drug result negative? If your is your drug cell, your drug test positive? I've been abstinent. I used. I, uh, you know, I whatever. And just being mindful that like words like that carry connotations that can really be deep. Um, also, this idea of enabling versus codependent, these are terms that are commonly used in a lot of settings as well. And they, what I find the most troubling about enabling is that it assumes that in any way that we ever had control over people's behaviors. And I'm sorry for many people who have God complexes, um, whether or not we tell someone to do something, they're still going to do what they're going to do. Oftentimes, if people value our opinions enough, they may take them into consideration. But oftentimes, when it comes to drug use, it wasn't just that someone gave me a sterile syringe, that it somehow gave me permission to use drugs, because I still had to go out and cop the drugs. I still had to prep the shot. I still had to put the needle in my arm. And so this idea that you can enable something or that you can put, like, unless you're actually putting the drug in someone's body, you want to create a context in which you can have conversations talk about health, talk about well-being, show your love and care and support for someone, show them that you're there for them no matter what, show them that you'll be there whether they come back with a positive drug screen or a negative one, show them that you want to talk about why is it that you didn't turn it into a vendor? Because that's progress in my mind. And I would always make sure to say that with my clients when they would come in and say, when I was working at the needle exchange, because I had clients working on abstinence goals at the needle exchange. I was a clinician at the needle exchange. So people were getting needles in the room adjoining mine, but clients were also coming directly to me to talk about how they didn't want to pick up needles and they were going towards abstinence. And so I would have clients who I was working on with towards abs abstinence and they would come in and tell me I used this weekend. And I would say, how much, where and when, and what were you doing? And then I would say, so then why did you stop? Why'd you come in today? What made you come in today? That is a different kind of framing that can invite, again, a conversation into like, look at you, you showed restraint. Look at you, you walked away. Look at you, you still showed up here. That's huge, right? Um, and I notice I'm getting very in the weeds with these, but I could continue going. But I hope that you can kind of extrapolate from what I said, that like this idea of codependency as well, this idea that relationships are somehow pathological when actually we can learn different coping skills and we don't need to characterize you as having this trait that means that you're somehow enabled to maintain boundaries with people. Um, and then also this idea that people have addictive personalities. Again, from the drug set setting model, calling someone an addictive personality minimizes the fact that they use drugs in certain circumstances that might make it easier or harder to use certain drugs or make it positive or negative, but it also depends on the drugs. We don't want to ground someone's relationship with drugs in just some sort of 
broken characteristic that this person has, rather than the fact that, you know, drug use is a complex behavior and choice responding to circumstances and events, right? And so what does harm reduction look like in practice? And I, I always think it's funny that I have these two here. Uh, so on the left is Stephen Malloy. He's a harm reduction advocate out of Scotland. On the right is Pete Davidson, Pete Davidson, Pete Davidson, who is a harm reduction researcher in San Francisco. Um, and so Stephen's card says drug treatment works when it's low threshold. And on the right, um, uh, Pete's card says drug treatment works when we provide what people need, not what we want them to need. So as I said to you before, you know, we have a treatment system, a whole continuum of care. People can go to outpatient, detox, rehab, residential, what have you, right? But really what we've learned is that in any given year, 90% of people who use substances and met criteria for a substance use disorder or an addiction, according to the DSM-5, did not receive treatment in the past year. And this comes up in national surveys year after year after year. And it's a survey that's conducted by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And the survey is called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And so every year they conduct a stratified sampling survey. They go to every single um, state in the country. They, they look at all the counties. They do like a whole like strategy to outreach. And they interview Americans over the age of 12 about their substance use patterns. And what they find is that of the people who met criteria for a substance use disorder, the vast majority will say that they did not receive treatment. And when they're asked the follow-up question, why didn't you receive treatment? The number one response is, I didn't wanna stop using drugs. So what does that tell us? First of all, it tells us that there's high prevalence of untreated substance use disorder in the community, but it tells us that even people with substance related problems who know that they have problems aren't ready to give them up and they know that the only way to get help in our current system is to agree to commit to abstinence to be able to connect with services. And so for me, this tells me this is exactly the community that we need to tap into with harm reduction, because if they're not ready to quit yet, but they know treatments available, how do we help them stay safe now right. And how can we get them to come to us as providers um, so that we can find out like ways and strategies and tools that we can give them to stay safe? Um, and, you know, what can we use to attract them to us? But also, like, how can we get to the communities who need who need it the most? How, you know, was it whether it's through mobile service, telehealth services, mail delivery? We've got incredible mail delivery syringe and naloxone programs operating in many parts of the country. But like operating with this idea that maybe this is a group of people, the vast majority of people who meet criteria for substance use disorders, who are disconnected from services, but who could be accessing some sort of help and support in the community. Because ultimately, as I see it, as a former treatment provider and as someone who believes that treatment works, the problem right now is that treatment is the only option and not everyone's ready, willing, or able to commit to that kind of uh, requirements, right? And that really, in my belief as a social worker, that our systems of care should be on a continuum, a true continuum of low threshold to high threshold to get everyone in, right? Because currently high threshold means what? Doing, scheduling an appointment, showing up for an intake, completing the evaluation, having the right insurance, being able to show up as soon as the opening is available, um, and then committing to abstinence from day one, and being subjected to routine drug screenings, and having to show up to treatment, and, you know, having ramifications if you don't show up to care, and eventually, you know, being at risk of being terminated from services, right, because you got to be able to jump through all the hoops. But we really don't have any alternative on the other side, where it's like, come as you are, pop in when you can, get what you need, and come back when you need it, again, right? Because I think that what's happening right now is having such a high threshold system neglects so many people who could be helped, right? And so thinking about like, how can all of the services that we provide be expanded to be slightly lower threshold to connect and swoop in those exact people who might not be ready for the broader services that we're trying to provide? The other thing is, is that it needs to be client-centered and collaborative services, right? Um, so on the left, we have Blythe Barno, who is a prominent harm reduction faith leader in Ohio. 
And her card says, harm reduction means honoring the dignity, agency, and heart of each person. And on the left, or on, on the right, we have drug treatment works when it is user-specific and flexible. So again, I've kind of already conveyed this already, but like, it's really important if you want to deliver services to people who use drugs, including high-risk people who use drugs, you have to convey a neutral stance towards substance use. If it becomes that thing that you raise your eyebrow about, smirk about, have a, you know, kind of reaction about, it's going to come through to that person and immediately you're going to be put in that category of people I can't talk to about my drugs who can't handle the truth, right? And it's really important in these conversations to start where the client is, right? Explore their priorities, values, and concerns. What are they worried about? What do they want to change? What do they think you can help with? And where do you guys want to start, right? Sometimes it's that simple. And being ready to have an individualized planning process and a no one-size-fits-all approach because every person is going to come in with different patterns of substance use, different patterns of substance-related problems, and different goals and motivations for change. But they're also going to be coming at you in different circumstances to be able to even work towards those goals, to even be able to help you, right, or to get help. The other really important thing, and again, you can put me on record for saying this, I am a harm reductionist and I am going to say this, abstinence is great. I'll say it again, abstinence is great. But what I will also say is that it's not for everyone, right? Because I live in the reality and understand that I live in the reality of a world in which not everybody is ready, willing, or able to abstain whether it's right now, whether it's six months from now, whether it's a year from now, there are gonna be people who aren't gonna be ready or willing or able to change. But truly from my heart, I believe that everyone deserves help and compassion regardless, right? And Alan Marlett again would say that harm reduction is a radical stance of compassionate pragmatism rather than moralistic idealism. So what do we mean by that? It means being practical and pragmatic that you're working with real life humans who are going to be dealing with struggles and challenges, um, but who are also going to slip, who are going to have a hard time sometimes. But the fact that they keep coming back is what matters, right? And I want to be practical and realistic and be compassionate throughout that, be compassionate throughout that. Rather than having this moralistic idealism, well, like, but drug use is bad, but you were doing so good. Oh my God, I can't believe that happened to you. Why would you go out and do that? I thought we were doing so well. I'm really disappointed. You know, those kinds of things, right? And understanding that people are going to use drugs, whether or not they're connected to you and services. But wouldn't you like to better have tabs on them and a relationship with them so that the day that they needed help, they know whose door to knock on or who to call? Wouldn't it be great if along the way, they still just knew you were in their corner rooting for them and making sure that they were staying as safe as possible. Um, you know, a common phrase that I hate using, but that is often kind of used a lot is true. It's, you know, this saying that dead addicts can't recover, right? And again, I hate the word addict, cringe. Um, but it has the right premise, right? Because if we're so busy waiting for people to commit to abstinence that we let them die on our streets without naloxone or without a safe place to go, um, are we even creating a space for recovery? Or are we telling you again, our, our help and our support are conditional. I will help you on the condition that you meet my requirements for being worthy of care. You're willing to jump through my hoops. And if you aren't, sorry, go back to the streets, right? Um, and that successful, successful outcomes and treatment should be thought of as like, well, how, are they showing up to appointments? Did she tell me she actually got a refill of that, of, of her hep C medication because she's taking it? Um, you know, uh, is she, is she showing up? It's been years since she's been connected to anything, but she's starting to show up. That's huge. Right. Or she told me that she started to use sterile syringes now and she's not sharing needles with her partner anymore. Um, and that now she's disposing of them safely instead of uh, throwing them into her trash can. We've taught her about using laundry detergent bottles um, as 
as better uh, disposal tools, right? So when she can't come to the needle exchange, she's at least safely disposing of it, duct taping it, marking it with an X so that like no one, no kid is going to get stuck. No garbage worker is going to get stuck. And, you know, like she's at least doing something, right? And that we can expand our definitions of health and well-being beyond whether or not someone has a chemical in their body because they showed up, they called you, they made that appointment, and, and they're taking some steps. Because remember, everyone's going to be coming from a different place. We can't expect someone who's been disconnected from services, who's still actively hallucinating, who still hasn't been given housing or an SRO yet, to somehow always know what day of the week it is to be able to show up for a session. But if he remembers to call me whenever he gets a chance, he comes knocking on my door and sometimes I'm available and I can see him. That's actually kind of huge, right? And that at its core, I believe that harm reduction is trauma-informed care. Why? Because what is one key characteristic of, of a traumatic experience? What is a qualifying characteristic of trauma? Is the feeling of powerlessness being able to not stop what happened to you or someone else, or not being able to control what you were exposed to, right? And so if trauma survivors already have been made to feel powerless and helpless, sometimes we have to acknowledge that sometimes using a drug was the way I took charge of my feelings. I took charge of my body. I controlled what happened to me. I changed how I felt. He didn't change how I felt because he, he did that to me, right? And that oftentimes for especially trauma survivors, substance use is a proactive behavior to cope, to deal, to, to actually get through their lives, right? And that we have to acknowledge that, that drug use for some people was adaptive until it wasn't, right? And so we can't just make it seem like you're an idiot for continuing to do this despite experiencing negative consequences because for, for so long it did work and still to some degree it still works and we have to respect that right um and that harm reduction unlike a lot of how we traditionally provide other kinds of services does not involve us exercising power authority control over someone else because you are going to make your decision i want to be here right i'm not going to shame you for trying to do the best you can. I'm not gonna blame you for not being perfect all the time and whatever perfect is. And I'm not gonna stigmatize you for surviving. Um, and we don't acknowledge enough that trauma, uh, that treatment itself can be re-traumatizing and triggering. I start attaching to you as an authority figure, a trusted, loving, caring authority figure, maybe a parental substitute. And then I disappointed you. And then I felt like an F up. And you kind of made me feel like an F up. And you told me you couldn't see me anymore. You told me that you had to refer me somewhere else. You told me that you were disappointed in me. What does that do to a person who's been let down and disappointed and harmed like that for so long? Um, and so thinking about those kinds of things and how those dynamics can play out in our work. So like, what are some examples of of harm reduction policies, right? So as I mentioned to you before, in New York City, we've got two overdose prevention centers where people can come. There's medical staff on site, there's peers, um, there's acupuncture, there's showers, there's laundry, there's a chill out space, there's snacks and there's water. And so people can use their drugs on site. And if they have an adverse event or an overdose, it can be intervened immediately. And they can learn that like I am still taking steps to care for myself. Every time I don't inject in an alleyway with puddle water and an old needle that I found on the ground, but instead go to this place with good lighting and people who love me, who truly want to see me, who want to be there for me, I am actually taking care of myself. And that's a radical thing. The uh, giving sterile equipment, including pipes and syringes, uh, Obviously, we, we see access to methadone uh, and buprenorphine or suboxone as really key harm reduction strategies, providing people with tools to check their drugs, such as fentanyl test strips, but also more advanced chemical uh, analyses like FTIR and GCMS machines so that they know what they're consuming and they know how to mitigate those harms and risks, um, providing them with drug education. You know, no one ever tells you, don't mix a depressant and an opioid. People just have to figure that stuff out. No one, like, no one teaches you that sometimes you got to wait for the effects to kick in when you take mushrooms. So don't re-up, right? And so much of that commonplace education, unfortunately, 
is that second stream. You've got to learn it from someone else, or you got to learn it through trial and error and pray to God you wake up and you make it. And it doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, allowing access to naloxone, the overdose, opioid overdose reversal drugs. Um, and, you know, obviously talking about this idea of a safe supply of drugs. There's been an incredible movement in our in Canada right now where pharmaceutical grade fentanyl and opioids are being given to people who use these street drugs and huge, huge improvements are happening in their lives because as soon as they get pharmaceutical grade substances, they're able to then reduce the risk of overdose, show up to their medical appointments, get their lives on track, and they're not at risk for overdose. Um, and we need to start having conversations like that. Um, also thinking about how our drug policies can be changed, right? As long as drug use remains a crime, people who use drugs will be treated as criminals and only certain drugs, right? And as long as you're entrenched in the criminal legal system, it's going to get in the way of getting the best care and services you need. But also, you're going to have to leave with the, live, live your life with the lifelong ramifications of a criminal record. And that's oftentimes something we don't talk enough about, was that we tell people to go into recovery after years of using drugs and having really rough criminal records and expect them to somehow be able to find a job that can pay them a living wage and somehow also be able to afford housing um, without having to turn to the underground market for extra money. The kinds of jobs that people with criminal records are eligible for often really sabotage their recovery. And so my organization has worked to decriminalize the possession of all uh, drugs for personal possession um, in the state of Oregon. And arrests have gone down dramatically, which means that people can actually focus on their lives and they don't have lifelong ramifications for being having encountered the police, which can actually mean that they can get that credential, get that degree, um, and uh, move on with their lives, right? And having a conversation about regulating drugs, whatever that looks like, right? And some of the strategies that we need to really watch ourselves from, from really promoting, because it's going to create more harms in people's lives, are any sort of harsher penalties that are going to affect users, any sort of strategies that are going to focus so much money on law enforcement without an equal, if not greater, investment in treatment and harm reduction access. Because again, we can punish and arrest people, but if we don't build the infrastructure for, for them to get the help, we're actually just creating a system in which we are criminalizing people for having a health issue, right? Um, but anyway, so I know I'm coming to the end of my time, um, but I wanted to just kind of leave you with this closing message. Challenge your own thoughts on drug use and drug users. This is not about being comfortable. Access to kind, to humane, kind, loving, and compassionate treatment is a basic human right. And um, so I wanted to uh, stop that. Um, and I see that we, I got ahead of myself. Um, and so I'm happy to take uh, questions. Okay, so Mary Beth says, we are seeing increased panicked rhetoric and policy emerging around xylazine, as we have seen with fentanyl. What are you and DPA working on to counter the moral panic and encourage better public health messaging and policy around xylazine? So for those of you who aren't familiar, xylazine is a, a veterinary sedative that's used with large mammals, such as horses. Um, and it's being cut into fentanyl supplies in parts of the South and in the Northeast, although it is starting to show up in drug supplies uh, in the Midwest and on the West Coast. So what's unusual about xylazine is that it's a heavy duty sedative. So it's being cut into fentanyl specifically like 99% of the time. It's basically infiltrated the whole drug supply in Philadelphia. And so what happens is people think that they're just shooting fent and what they're doing is they're actually shooting fent with xylazine. And so they are getting knocked out for like three, four, five hours. And so it doesn't trigger that part of your body that says, ooh, I fell asleep on my arm and my arm's getting losing blood supply. So people are falling and landing on their limbs and not waking up hours later, um, robbed, raped, left for dead. Um, but it's also complicating overdose response because people are getting administered naloxone and they're starting to breathe again because the naloxone knocks off the fentanyl. But the xylazine is keeping them sedated. And so a lot of people are also thinking, oh, are these people having naloxone resistant 
overdoses? No, they're actually having sedative opioid overdoses. So the federal government wants to schedule xylazine as a Schedule Three drug because it's currently not scheduled because it's not really used for human purposes. We at DPA are actually challenging this push to schedule xylazine. And the reason why we do not want to schedule xylazine as a Schedule Three drug is because xylazine is already being cut into fentanyl, which comes with harsh penalties. So most users are going to be the ones targeted by arrest and users who unknowingly bought fentanyl that had xylazine in them may be more likely to experience penalties for drugs that they didn't even know were in their possession. So instead, we're asking the, the Biden administration to double down investments in research on xylazine because we still don't understand how xylazine works in the body. And a lot of people who are accidentally injecting xylazine are developing really painful sores and wounds all over their arms. These are really deep uh, deep, deep uh, scars, and people have had to have limbs amputated because of this. So we want more research on understanding what it does, more research on understanding how to treat withdrawal, and also how to keep people off of it. But we also want to ramp up all the treatments we know that already help people use opioids, because most of the people who are accidentally consuming xylazine, were they're trying to get their opioid. So we still want to ramp up, like, how do we get more access to methadone? Because if a person who uses opioids that are cut with xylazine gets their methadone, they're, more, they're less likely to keep using street drugs. If they get their buke, they're less likely to be using street drugs. We also want everyone to still have access to naloxone, and we need more public health education on how to recognize a xylazine overdose and how to keep people safe and breathing um, to make sure that they're getting the help that they need. Um, and so that's kind of what we are doing at DPA, and I'm happy to... Um, talk about that further. And before I forget, I'm, I also want to give everyone my email address because I'm running out of time. And you can also follow me on Twitter at my harm reduction if you want to stay in touch. Um, and I'm sorry that question was long, but I think xylazine is a really important drug for us to be thinking about and talking about. Cami, absolutely. It would be great um, to think about legalization. But in the meantime, as long as drugs are not criminal and rather a civil penalty, we can really help people because we know that a lot of people don't call 911 during an overdose because they don't want to get arrested for possession. So decriminalization could be a great gateway for us to kind of think about more progressive policies. Um, uh, yeah, so so I know that we are just on time. So please reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, uh, but I am going to give it back to Ashley. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation, Dr. McCarty. That was absolutely fantastic. And I do see we do have um, more questions, but we are at time. And she graciously shared her Twitter as well as your email address, correct, in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. So feel free to reach out or reach out to Women's Foundation. We can also relay that message. Um, she is gracious enough to share her PowerPoint with us. So we will be sending that as a PDF to all attendees. And just as a reminder, if you did dial in by phone, please email info at Women's Foundation with the phone number you dialed in with, as well as your name, so you can count as attended. So thank you so much, Dr. Sheila. We appreciate your time and your expertise and your knowledge. Um, it was it was fantastic. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we had well over 300 attendees, so we- Fantastic. Yes, it was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.